before I get started in the talk, I'll just give you a quick background about our company, Bales Medical. We were incorporated in 1986, so actually this year is our 25th year in business. It was uh, begun as an importer and distributor of uh, medical device products from France and United States. So we would import high-tech devices, have them approved and sell them. And at a certain point, we decided to start developing our own products. So from that beginning in 1986, we've grown to be a manufacturer of medical devices that are used in the heart, back pain, and radiology. So presently we have two major facilities, one in Mississauga and one corporate head office in Montreal. In our Mississauga office we have our R&D, engineering, manufacturing, we have clean rooms, a fairly large uh, manufacturing size area as you can see, 20,000 square feet. We have full quality systems and also are compliant with FDA's QSR systems. We're approximately 120 employees in Canada. We're now branching out into the United States where we've engaged eight, it's small sales force, but it's our starting sales force of eight people there. And we have a small office in London, England with two people to support our distributors in Europe. And presently we export to about 60 countries. The type of products that we work on are focused in minimally invasive therapies we are working and selling right now a left access, left heart access device, a transeptal needle. When physicians need to go from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, we're selling technologies to help them do that. We're also just now coming out with technologies to unblock clogged arteries, specifically in the legs and the central veins. We're not yet bringing that out for the heart because it's a little too dangerous and not developed enough for that application yet. We have a fourth application, which is in treating pain, specifically from bone cancers. And a, that's a third application, I mean, and a fourth one we're working on in minimally invasive surgeries. So as you can see, we have a broad set of product lines, but we are focused in minimally invasive, meaning we're not doing open surgeries through, through catheters, specialized needles, and the like. So today I was asked to talk about the role of the universities and research institutions in supporting and helping to build a medical technology industry. We have great experience in that area. Over the past 12 years, we know we've worked with a number of different universities, both here in Canada and in the United States. And I'll be frank with you, some of those alliances have been very productive and some have been a waste of time and money. Why? Before we get into the details of that, just to give you an idea of the type of alliances you can have with the university or research institution, we've engaged them to do direct research. We've done product development with the help of clinicians, physicians that are associated with research in universities, research institutions. We've used their animal research labs. Universities and research institutions have phenomenal infrastructures. We've used services that they've offered, histology studies, for example. And obviously, we've had tremendous amounts of ad hoc meetings and discussions and exchanges with uh, professors, researchers, technicians. So over the course of our years as a, developing, a company developing products, we've had tremendous amount of interaction. The first thing to understand when we talk about how we can work together is what are our differences? And there are fundamental differences between a university and a business. And universities are, as we know, primarily there for higher learning and have a focus on fundamental scientific research. That's their raison d'etre, that's why they're there. Businesses are in business to make profit. In our organizations, we tend to do research as well, but we are focused on commercial work, commercial research and development, and really experimental development is a larger part of that as opposed to doing fundamental research. 
those are the two worlds. And we ask ourselves, well, how can we collaborate and work together? And there are great opportunities, but if we don't understand where we're coming from, there are great pitfalls as well. A lesson that we've learned is that universities or research centers work best if they are not in the critical path development of your project. What do we mean by that? So as you lay out a project plan and you need certain things done at a certain time frame and that sense of urgency that a, uni that a university does not have but that a business does have is necessary to drive a project forward. So if you put a university in the middle of a critical path of your project, you will be extremely frustrated. And not that they're not of goodwill on their parts, it's just that they have other things that are prioritized for them. They're not there to drive a business forward. That's not their fundamental reason to exist. This device here that I'm showing is our, one of our first devices for treating babies that are born with pulmonary atresia. It's a very unique device, when a commonly known uh, treatment for blue babies. If a baby was born and their heart valve didn't open. We had tremendous support from the Toronto Sick Children's uh, in this development. Their clinicians gave us feedback, we worked with them, they did testing, animal testing, so it was a great success. As well, we worked with a called Polytechnic in, in uh, Montreal. And there, uh, Professor Savard, who went on to start the first undergraduate biomedical engineering department in a university in Canada, he did a tremendous amount of underlying basic research on how this technology, this energy source, I should say, is applied in the heart. So, though I say that they can't be in the critical path, they can still do a tremendous amount to support your, your development. And this is a great example of it. Just keep in mind that don't put any research or any demands that are in the critical path of a project. This is a lesson that I'll push out to people that are involved strictly and only in research, and that is the quote of Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison, talking about genius or about inspiration, what have you not, 1% of an idea, 1%, the idea is worth 1%, 99% is the perspiration. So many times when we talk to a professor or researcher, he's come up with an idea. And it's a great idea, it's an interesting idea. But the reality is that there are tons of ideas out there. Probably in this room, a number of you have amazing ideas of some new device, new drug, new product that could have a huge impact. So the idea is important, but you need to know the value of an idea alone is almost worthless. That's something that we try and underline to technology transfer offices and professors. And we really ask them to keep that in mind when we sit down to discuss something, is that yes, you have a great idea. It's worth 1% of the deal. Why do I bring that up? Because the next point I want to talk about is the contract process. As a businessman, I'm involved in doing contracts continuously. I was almost supposed to be a lawyer in a previous life. I dodged that bullet, but sometimes I think they got me anyways. <laughs> the amount of contracts I have to read. I'll give you an example of a difficult process I had with one university. I won't name it. It took me six weeks to negotiate a non-disclosure agreement, Yeah, an NDA. And I tried to explain to them that I'll probably sign one of these or two of these a day sometimes if we're doing a lot of research or at least one a week. But I had to listen and have explained to me how it worked. Okay, so that's just an egregious example of a process that exists nonetheless, which is that it's a very long and tedious process we find when we're dealing with a university. Why? I believe it's because there's a tremendous fear on the technology transfers office that they're not going to get a good deal. 
And for them, no deal is better than a bad deal. There's such a fear. And I've seen both sides of the coin because, say, for example, when we've dealt with a great institution like the Cleveland Clinic, a premier institution in North America for research, they're so easy to do business with. The contract that we're sent is reasonable. They're not asking for my first child. They're not asking for $3 million up front before they sign an NDA. They're just reasonable. And in fact, through that reasonableness, Cleveland Clinic is known as a center where phenomenal amounts of innovation and products and technologies come out of. I had another university one time where we wanted to do a little bit of research, use one of their services, and they were going to engage a student to do that. And the contract that they wanted us to sign was such that if he came up with anything, <laughs> that it we were suddenly partners in this project. And I tried to explain to them, listen, the likelihood that your student even heard of this type of technology, let alone knows anything about it, is, is so far-fetched. We're going to educate him, bring him up to speed, give him everything he knows, and if by chance in one in a thousand he comes up with some little idea, we're not becoming partners. We couldn't come to a meeting of minds there, so quite simply, we didn't need them. It was helpful, but we went somewhere else. Another point which I touched on earlier is that in both research institutions and universities, there's a phenomenal amount of infrastructure. My personal feeling is that that infrastructure should be made more readily available to companies. Why? Because then you will have that cross-pollination. You'll have people speaking to each other. You'll have work going on. You'll have water cooler discussions where something good can come out of it. But I find many times there's a reluctance to open up that infrastructure to companies. Again, a fear that, well, we can't be seen just to be a commercial institution or we're not sure about this or we'll just let it sit. Nonetheless, as I've laid out a few of the pitfalls, I do believe that there are phenomenal opportunities in working with universities and research institutions. As I've mentioned, we've worked directly with clinicians in many centers and that's been phenomenally helpful to us. We've collaborated with professors and they help to round out our knowledge because we don't know everything and they have very in-depth specific knowledge that we can call upon to really help us overcome a technical problem, an issue. As I pointed out, we've had basic research uh, science, basic science done on our, some of our projects, which has helped to alleviate fear of a clinician to say, are you sure this is not going to be dangerous? Are you sure this is how this works? I mentioned we could share infrastructure. And finally, the, great, the, the, the ability to transfer phenomenal and great ideas out of a university to an entrepreneur. And for the university to know we can generate excellent ideas, but we're not a business and we can't take that excellent idea anywhere near to a product or to a business. And to understand that. So in conclusion, I would look at academic alliances and say to be successful, universities and research centers have to be easy to do business with. Understanding very well that they are not a business, but nonetheless, if they want to cooperate and collaborate with businesses, it's a university that has to become easy to do business with. Thank you.